Thank you very much. The next item of business is a statement by the Lord Advocate on malicious prosecutions. The Lord Advocate will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on the Lord Advocate. Sorry about that, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I say I'm grateful for the opportunity to make a statement following the disposal last week of the actions brought against me by David Whitehouse and Paul Clark. Although those actions concerned events which predated my appointment as Lord Advocate, it was and is my responsibility as the current incumbent to account for them. There are ongoing proceedings related to this matter that constrains what I can say today, but I welcome the fact that I am now free to begin the process of public and parliamentary accountability and to reiterate the commitment the Crown has already given to that process. The prosecutions which gave rise to these cases arose from police investigations into the administration, the, the purchase of Rangers Football Club by Craig White in 2011 and into the administration of the club and its sale to Charles Green in 2012. These were large and complex investigations. Ultimately, seven individuals were prosecuted. This statement is concerned only with the position of Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse. On 14th November 2014, Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse were detained and brought to Glasgow. They were held in custody before appearing in court on 17th November on a petition containing charges relating to Mr. White's purchase of Rangers. This started the clock for a statutory time bar which, unless extended, required the Crown to serve an indictment in respect of these charges by 16 September 2015. In High Court cases, after an accused has appeared on petition, the Crown undertakes a process of investigation and analysis called precognition. When completed, the precognition contains a detailed narrative of the evidence and an analysis of whether the evidence is sufficient to support criminal charges. The precognition is submitted to Crown Counsel for a decision on whether to issue an indictment. Whilst precognition is not a statutory requirement, it is a long-standing, routine and essential feature of Crown practice in relation to High Court cases. It provides assurance that there is a proper evidential basis for the indictment and along with Crown Counsel's instruction, a record of the basis of the decision. This case was exceptional in its scale and complexity. By early September 2015, with the expiry of the time bar approaching, the precognition process was incomplete and essential investigations were still ongoing. On 3rd September, the Crown applied to the court for a nine-month extension of the time bar. The Sheriff granted a three-month extension. An appeal by Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse against that extension was refused. Meantime, on 2nd and 3rd September 2015, Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse appeared in court again on a second petition, which contained new and separate charges relating to the second matter which the police had been investigating namely the administration of Rangers and its sale to Charles Green in 2012. On 16th September 2015, Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse, with five other accused, were indicted. The charges against them derived from both the November 2014 and the September 2015 petitions. At that time, the precognition process in relation to the no November 2014 petition was still incomplete, and there was demonstrably no precognition in relation to the September 2015 petition, which had only just been initiated. Essential investigations were still ongoing in respect of the charges derived from the November 2014 petition, and there was evidence available which objectively was obviously inconsistent with the charges against these two accused derived from the September 2015 petition. On 2nd December 2015, a second indictment was served superseding the first one. At a preliminary hearing in February 2016, following legal argument, Crown Counsel withdrew certain of the charges. On 22nd February, the judge dismissed the remaining charges against Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse. Crown Counsel advised the court that consideration would be given to a further indictment against them. A Crown Office press statement issued that day indicated that a fresh indictment would be brought. 
This was corrected by a further statement the following day. On 25th May 2016, the Crown advised Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse that there would be no further proceedings against them. And on 3rd June 2016, Crown Council formally advised the court of that position. In August 2016, Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse initiated civil actions against me. I had been appointed on 2nd June 2016, seeking damages on the grounds of malicious prosecution and breaches of Articles 5 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. They also advanced claims against the Chief Constable of Police Scotland. I advanced a defence relying on established legal authority that the Lord Advocate is immune from common law liability. That defence was upheld at first instance, but in October 2019, the inner house of the Court of Session overturned the previous legal authority and allowed the claims to proceed. On 20th August 2020, I admitted liability to Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse. Those admissions followed the conclusion of a very substantial and lengthy investigation undertaken by the legal team, including external counsel, instructed on my behalf. As a result of that investigation, I concluded that the decisions to place Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse on petition in September 2015 and to indict them were indefensible in law. I concluded that those decisions proceeded without probable cause, i.e. without a proper evidential basis, in circumstances which met the legal test for malicious prosecution. That legal test can, in certain circumstances, be met even though no individual had malice in the popular sense of a spiteful motive. My acceptance of liability in this case did not depend on any individual being malicious in that popular sense. I cannot at this time disclose in detail the basis upon which liability was admitted, but when it is free to do so, the Crown will disclose the basis for those admissions in full, including to this Parliament. What I can say is that there were in this case profound departures from the normal practices, including precognition, which are designed to ensure and routinely do ensure that any prosecution in the High Court has a proper basis. I also admitted breaches of Article 5 in respect of the detention of Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse in November 2014 and September 2015, and of Article 8 in respect of the incorrect press release of February 2016. After the admissions of liability, mediations took place with both pursuers and agreement reached to settle their claims. Each of them has been paid £10.5 million in damages and to date over £3 million has been paid to them in aggregate by way of expenses. These two pursuers were very high earning professional people and the damages paid reflect a reasonable estimate of the loss which they sustained as a result of being prosecuted. I have written to the Justice Committee about the financial implications. On 24th December 2020, I issued written apologies to each of Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse. They should not have been prosecuted, and as the current Lord Advocate and Head of the System of Criminal Prosecution, I apologised unreservedly that they had been. I re reiterate that unreserved apology publicly to Mr. Clark and Mr. Whitehouse today. Although this case involved significant departures from standard practice, Lessons have been learned and will continue to be learned. The recognition process has been reinforced. And in 2018, I established new arrangements for the management and oversight of large and complex cases. Those arrangements are now well established and provide a substantial safeguard against anything like this happening again. In my Justice Human Rights Day lecture in December 2016, I said this, a fair and independent prosecution service taking decisions rigorously, independently and robustly in accordance with the evidence is, I believe, essential to the freedom under the law which we enjoy as citizens of this country. Scottish prosecutors and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have a justified reputation for fairness, integrity and independence. The seriousness of what happened in this case should not obscure the truth that day in and day out Scotland's public prosecutors and the staff who support them fulfil their responsibilities with professionalism and skill. They take hard decisions rigorously, robustly and in accordance with the evidence and secure the public interest in the fair, effective and robust administration of criminal justice in Scotland. In this particular case, there was a very serious failure in the system of prosecution. 
It did not live up to the standards which I expect, which the public and this parliament are entitled to expect, and which the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service expects of itself. What happened in this particular case should not have happened. As Lord Advocate and Head of the System of Prosecution in Scotland, I tender my apology to this Parliament and to the public that it did happen, and for the consequent cost to the public purse. I confirm my own commitment and the Crown's commitment to supporting a process of inquiry into what happened in this case once related matters have concluded. And I express my own determination that nothing like it should happen again. Thank you very much. The Lord Advocate will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question or to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I remind members I am a practicing solicitor. I thank the Lord Advocate for advance sight of his statement. It is an extraordinary catalogue of unexplained, profound departures from the normal practices. What is indefensible, to use the Lord Advocate's word, is that as the decisions, quote, proceeded without probable cause, i.e. without a proper evidential basis, end quote, this was a malicious prosecution. President officer, let's be absolutely clear here. This was not simple human error or an obscure legal mistake. This is our system of prosecution admitting that acting with malice, there was a move to throw innocent men behind bars and destroy their reputations. Which begs the obvious question, Lord Advocate, just how many times in Scottish legal history has there been a malicious prosecution? And in any event, crucially, I note that the Crown is committed to a process of inquiry. So focusing on that, can the Lord Advocate confirm that this will be a fully independent, judge-led, public inquiry which demands to know why malicious prosecutions were pursued in defiance of evidence? Will it investigate the actions of the Lord Advocate, his predecessor and all agents involved? And if not, how on earth can the Crown expect the people of Scotland to conclude anything other than that it is brushing this appalling state of affairs under the carpet. Lord Advocate. I hope that nobody would suggest that in coming to Parliament today at the first opportunity when I am free to do so, that I have, could properly be accused of brushing anything under the carpet. And I've committed myself and the Crown to supporting a process of inquiry once related matters have been concluded, and those are matters which need to be resolved before um, uh, uh, that process of inquiry uh, proceeds. Um, on the first point that uh, Mr Kerr made, um, as I observed in my statement, the legal test for malicious prosecution can in circumstances be met even though no individual had malice in the popular sense of a spiteful motive. And I should be clear that my acceptance of liability in this case did not depend on any individual being malicious in that popular uh, sense. Um, but that is not for a moment to minimize the seriousness of what happened in these cases. Quite the reverse, as I observed in my statement, uh, this represented a very serious failure in the system of prosecution uh, in Scotland. I was asked how many times this has happened. Um, as I've emphasized in my statement, routinely in High Court cases, a process of, known as precognition is undertaken. And that process um, necessarily involves a, a careful collection, investigation, and analysis of the evidence. It involves a system of cross-checking and provides significant reassurance and should provide uh, reassurance to the public that routinely uh, in our system of prosecution cases are brought uh, on a, a proper basis. As I explained in my statement, in this case uh, that process uh, was incomplete when the case was indicted and essential investigations had not been completed. So this was a case in which the normal processes that routinely in every High Court case are followed were not followed. 
and the public should take reassurance from that that the prosecution system in Scotland is one which is robust, uh, fair, independent and upon which they can rely. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I also thank the Lord Advocate for advance sight of his statement. This case raises serious concerns that it was thought that the Lord Advocate was immune from common law liability would suggest they should also have been beyond reproach. We imagine there are checks and balances within the system between the police and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, where both challenge and question the activities and evidence in a case. This appears not to have happened or have gone seriously wrong in this situation with both being sued by David Whitehouse and Paul Clark. How could this have happened? Were there concerns raised internally or externally by the actions of both organisations at the time, especially when it came to light there was inconsistent evidence? The Lord Advocate says that the system has been improved, and there cannot be pro but there cannot be proper scrutiny of this until we know exactly what went wrong in the first place. Until this happens, how can he expect to restore confidence in the system? Lord Advocate. Yes, I suppose the first thing that I should say is that at this time there are um, continuing live proceedings related to this matter and regrettably, and I do regret it, that does constrain what I can say. Um, I have committed the Crown to engaging fully with public accountability for this uh, matter and the Crown has committed to making more information available when it is free to do so, including the basis upon which liability was admitted in this case, and to supporting a process of inquiry uh, when, uh, when it is possible to uh, do that. Um, the, so, so in terms of giving assurance to the public uh, that um, lessons will be learned and that there will be public understanding of what happened here, I hope that gives some assurance to uh, to uh, the member. Um, in terms of checks and balances, it's perhaps worth noting that, um, and this is again not to minimise, not in any, any sense to minimise what happened in this case, uh, that um, the court fulfilled its functions in dealing with certain charges, and indeed the Crown fulfilled its responsibilities uh, in terms of um, withdrawing charges and ultimately confirming that no prosecution uh, would uh, proceed. Now, as I say, that's not to minimise the significance of a prosecution being brought uh, without a proper basis. But there was, there, there the case, you know, there the system, the checks and balances in the system uh, fulfilled uh, their functions. Um, as I've explained, routinely within Crown Office, um, there is a process of preparation of High Court cases which involves the cross-checking of cases by um, uh, initially staff of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and ultimately by Crown Counsel uh, on the basis of a full narrative of the evidence and an analysis of that evidence. And all of those processes are designed to ensure what I'm confident that across the system we can be confident of, that prosecutions in Scotland are brought on a proper basis and that this case was uh, wholly exceptional. Thank you very much. I have a number of further questions. I am keen to get them all in if I can. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Lord Advocate reiterate what lessons have been learned and what improvements have been made to ensure that this will never happen again? Lord Advocate. Yes, um, the, key lesson, the key lesson is in relation to the management of large and complex cases. And as I stated in my statement, I've instituted new procedures for the internal management and oversight of that particular category of case. Those, those arrangements involve early agreement of the investigation and prosecution strategy, early and continuous engagement with the police, a project management approach to case preparation, a system of case management panels to scrutinize the case strategy, keep under review the progress of the case under reference to the strategy, and to address any issues which 
may emerge. And all of that aligns with a protocol which the High Court issued with my support in relation to the management of such cases once they're in court in 2018, which again encourages a proactive uh, approach to the uh, management of uh, such uh, cases. Murdo Fraser to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the, the Lord Advocate referred to the payment of £24 million made to White House and Clark, but these sums may well just be the tip of the iceberg because reports suggest that the total cost from this case could top £100 million given the outstanding cases. But can the Lord Advocate tell us if it is correct that in addition to these payments to White House and Clark, they were also both given tax indemnities so should HMRC come against them for tax, that will be made good by the Scottish Crown Office, and therefore the cost to the Scottish taxpayer will be much higher than the £24 million already paid. Lord Advocate. Yes. C can I first say that I recognise the significance of the sums involved in these cases, and Murdo Fraser is correct to observe that with other cases pending, um, the cost of the public purse will increase. The ultimate cost remains uh, to, be, to be seen. Um, on the specific issue of, of um, uh, a, a tax indemnity, um, um, the approach taken to the settlement of these cases was to reach a reasonable estimate of the actual loss that these individuals could uh, demonstrate the, 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 um, and um, an arrangement was entered into so that if, and it is an if, it is an if, um, there is an additional loss that they can properly show they've sustained in the way that Mr. Fraser describes, then uh, uh, that will be borne. If that happens, then uh, the, Crown, the Crown will, of course, account to the Justice Committee, as it already has done uh, at the end of last week uh, in relation to the costs involved in these cases. John Mason to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you. Now it's been established that the Lord Advocate does not have absolute immunity from civil liability. Is it going to make the Crown more cautious about pursuing prosecutions? And would that mean that criminals are less likely to be convicted? Lord Advocate. Yes. I'm absolutely determined that the... Um, um, what is in effect a change in the law in relation to the immunity of the Lord Advocate should not have that effect. And that is one of the reasons why I have put in place measures to strengthen the management of large and complex cases. Uh, wh wh what's critical in any case is that there should be a proper basis for the prosecutorial decision. And as I've explained um, in my statement, the process of recognition, which is routinely undertaken in all High Court cases, uh, provides confidence and assurance both to prosecutors themselves and to the public in that regard. I should say I have great confidence in the robustness of Scotland's prosecutors. They make difficult decisions uh, every day in the exercise of their judgment uh, and um, I'm determined to have in place systems that enable them to continue to take robust decisions uh, in the effective prosecution of crime. James Kelly to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The decisions made in this case may predate the current Lord Advocate, but there is serious questions about decision making and accountability within the Crown Office. There are serious errors here. The system failed, and as we've heard, the cost of the public purse is at least £24 million. Pounds. Can I ask the, the, the Lord Advocate what other area of the Scottish budget has had to be raided to fund the incompetency of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in this case? Lord Advocate. Uh, as the Finance Secretary um, advised the Parliament, I think, last week, um, arrangements have been made so that um, these cases will not affect the operational effectiveness of Crown Office. They don't affect the Crown Office's resource budget. Um, I think the, uh, the member's question would be better directed to the Finance Secretary. Liam MacArthur to be followed by John Finney. 
Can I thank the Lord Advocate for early sight of his statement? This is a true scandal in monetary terms on a scale with BIFAB and Ferguson Shipyard. The colossal waste of taxpayers' money runs to tens of millions of pounds that could have been spent on pandemic business support, education catch-up, or investment in mental health. And there could be worse news to come, given we don't yet know the extent of Police Scotland's exposure or the additional cases the Lord Advocate referred to. Given the overturning of Hester means that the Lord Advocate can now be held liable for serious errors from the past, what assurance can the Lord Advocate offer that no other skeletons lurk in the Crown Office closet? Lord Advocate. Well, I think the principal assurance that I can give is the um, description I've already given of the routine processes that are carried out in every High Court case um, of, of, of precognition. Um, it is fair to say that this case was wholly exceptional in uh, all sorts of ways. Um, uh, and um, I think that's the, that, that is the principal answer to um, the question that uh, Liam MacArthur uh, has raised, that we have a system of prosecution which has demonstrated robustness, fairness, effectiveness and integrity. This was a very serious uh, falling below the standards that all of us expect of that system. But the very fact that those expectations are so high and that um, this case has um, occasioned the um, justified reaction that it has is a reflection of the high standards that routinely our prosecutors meet every day, day in and day out in courts across the country. John Finney to be followed by James Dornan. Um, thank you, President Officer, and I also thank the Lord Advocate for early sight of his statement. Uh, Lord Advocate, uh, this was a, a very serious failure of the system of prosecution, and public confidence is vital in our justice system. Can the, uh, can the Lord Advocate outline what further steps will be taken to reassure a public that might reasonably think, well, if this can happen in such a high-profile case, with all that publicity, what chance do I have against the system? Lord Advocate. Um, well, I think the, the, first, um, the first reason why the public should have reassurance is, that, is the point I made a moment ago to Liam MacArthur, that routinely, day in and day out, our prosecution system um, operates effectively, robustly, fairly, and is understood and seen by the public to do so. Prosecutors take decisions which, if they're taken to court, are tested in court before the independent court and are tested by the... Um, examination, cross-examination skill uh, of, of, of those who represent persons who are accused. So not only are there protections and reassurances to be taken from the well-justified um, recognition of the integrity and skill of our public prosecutors, but um, the public can also have confidence because of the reputation, integrity and skill, both of the defence bar in testing prosecutions that are brought and ultimately of our court system in fairly and independently trying uh, any uh, case that is put into court. James Dornan to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Thank you, presiding officer. Having previously been a recognition officer, I'm surprised to see that the lack of recognition appears to have been a major failing in this case. But I wonder, Lord Advocate, if further to your statement you can give some detail to help provide reassurance that the Crown is indeed equipped to deal with complex financial crime going forward. Lord Advocate. Yes, in, 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 indeed. Um, um, the Crown, the Crown successfully prosecutes um, thousands of cases every day, every year, including complex financial crime. Uh, for example, last year, um, an accused was prosecuted in respect of a £12 million Ponzi scheme fraud involving 140 complainers and of laundering the proceeds of that crime. He was convicted and, and imprisoned for 14 uh, years. Um, Serious financial crime cases are dealt with in accordance with the arrangements I've described for large and complex uh, uh, cases. Um, and those uh, new arrangements which were put in place in 2018 should give reassurance that such cases will be effectively and properly investigated and prosecuted. Uh, and I may say that um, in the course of this parliament, 
the uh, budget allocation to Crown Office of Procurator Fiscal Service has increased um, some 42 per cent. And uh, while that was to deal with a range of pressures on the system, um, that has part of the um, uh, part, part, part of that um, additional budgetary resource ha has gone to ensure that the new system for the management of large and complex cases can be operated in the manner in which it's intended to. Adam Tompkins to be followed by Alex Neal. Uh, thank you, presenting officer. What happened was completely indefensible, Lord Advocate. So I have a simple question to which I want an answer. Was it incompetence or was it corruption? Lord Advocate. I've, uh, I've said what I can say about the circumstances. There were very significant departures from the normal practices which routinely provide safeguards uh, against what happened in, in this case. And I have made clear that the admission of liability in this case uh, was not predicated on any individual having subjective uh, malice. Uh, I should also say that um, uh, the investigation that was carried out into the uh, prosecutorial uh, work on this case uh, did not report uh, any criminal conduct uh, to me. Had it done so, I would have taken uh, action. Um, but that does not preclude, that does not preclude, should criminal allegations come forward, uh, them being uh, considered uh, and, uh, if, if, if appropriate, uh, it, it, it investigated, and I'm putting in place arrangements, including the in instruction of external senior counsel, so that uh, such a process can go forward if that's required. Alex Neal to be followed by Bill Kidd. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Lord Advocate whether the former Lord Advocate Frank Mulholland, Police Scotland, and the team of prosecutors who worked in this case agree with his decision to pay out millions of pounds of public money on the basis that the prosecution was malicious. Is his own decision-making in this case up to scratch and robust? Lord Advocate. Well, I have had to take the decision in relation to the civil action that was brought against me. I took that decision following the conclusion of a very substantial lengthy and carefully considered investigation undertaken by the legal team, including a team of external counsel instructed on my behalf. Um, this was a decision which it fell to me to take and for which I stand here and account to the Parliament. Bill Kidd to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Lord Advocate provide reassurance to victims and witnesses that arrangements have been made so that the settlements made will not affect the service that the Crown Office provides? Lord Advocate. Um, yes, I mean, I, 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 a moment ago I reminded um, members that the Cabinet Secretary of Finance last week told Parliament that arrangements had been made that uh, the meeting of these settlements would not have an impact on the uh, resource budget of Crown Office and indeed um, the budget allocation to Crown Office this year is um, significantly larger than it was last year and um, uh, as ever um, that uh, in part uh, reflects the commitment of the service to supporting victims and witnesses. Neil Findlay to be followed by Gillian Martin. The Lord Advocate uh, admits to a malicious prosecution but says no one showed malice. This takes political doublespeak to a whole new level. So can the Lord Advocate answer this dear question? Who is responsible for this expensive fiasco? Who is accountable? And where is the money coming from to pay for it? Clear questions, clear answers. Lord Advocate. Yes. Um, I proceeded in um, addressing this case on the basis of the relevant legal tests. Um, and as I explained in my statement, the legal test for malicious prosecution, uh, and I appreciate you know, the, 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 the wrong has that description, the legal test can in circumstances, certain circumstances be met, even though no individual had malice in the popular sense of 
of, of the word, and that was the basis upon which I accepted liability in this case. Uh, in terms of uh, responsibility, ultimately in our constitutional arrangements, it's for the Lord Advocate, as head of the system of criminal prosecution and investigation of deaths, to answer for the conduct of criminal prosecutions, whether in court, uh, as I do every day in the relation to the prosecutions that are brought in my name, uh, or here in Parliament, as I'm doing uh, uh, today. And as the current Lord Advocate, it's my constitutional responsibility to answer to this Parliament uh, for what happened uh, at this time. Um, I've said what I can say today about the circumstances, given other pending processes, um, and when it is free to do so, the Crown will disclose further information. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Lord Advocate has already given quite a lot of detail already, but I'd like to um, if he, ask him if he can outline what additional steps he will take to support public accountability and understanding about these types of cases. Lord Advocate. Yes. Uh, as I've said, as and when uh, the Crown is free to do so, it will disclose uh, further information about what happened in this case. Um, in particular, it will disclose the basis for the uh, admission of liability. Uh, and I and the Crown will support uh, a process of inquiry once all the related matters uh, have been dealt with. And a very brief final question from Grahamson. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Will there be a fully independent, judge-led public inquiry? Lord um, there's a motion in the name of Mr. Fraser uh, tomorrow on that subject, which we'll debate. Um, um, I've been very clear in my statement that I and the Crown will support a process of inquiry when all related matters, other related matters, are concluded. Uh, the, for the form, the ultimate form of that inquiry, uh, is something which uh, uh, will be for determination uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. That concludes questions on the statement by the Lord Advocate, and we will now move on to the next item of business.